So, yeah, let's start and uh, warm welcome to everyone after the first uh, panel session. Now, it's my great pleasure and honor to have Matthias Chaika with us for this first uh, plenary event of our graduate conference. Matthias Chaika is a professor of migration and integration and he is the head of the Department of Migration and Globalization at the University for Continuing Education Krems. That's a long sentence. And this is the first time that I have the chance to meet um, him in person, but he's very familiar to me through his research and writings because Matthias has become one of the most uh, inspiring uh, scholars on key themes in the field of uh, migration studies, namely the drivers and dynamics of migration processes, decision-making in uh, the field of migration, or also migration policy-making and its impacts. Around the team of Hein de Haas, for example, he has published very influential papers on the so-called globalization of migration, also on the restrictiveness and the effectiveness of migration policies and on the visa regimes, very often challenging preconceptions, not only in the public debate, but also in the academic sphere. And more recently, he has developed new areas of expertise, like the so-called brain drain, or the topical issue of mobility and immobility in the context of climate change. So today he will be presenting the main elements of his recent co-authored publication on European migration governance in the context of uncertainty. I asked him to orient his talk in that direction because I thought it could be a good fit with uh, our conference addressing the issue of migration and mobility in times of crisis. And I thought it could be uh, the opportunity to discuss how migration governance can be both the recipient, but also the producer of uncertainty and crisis, because he has two relevant illustrative cases, the so-called re refugee crisis and environment-induced migration. So thank you very much, uh, Matthias, for having accepted our invitation. He will be talking for about 50 minutes, maybe a bit more, one hour, uh, to present this research. And then we will have a Q&A with the audience for the remaining 40, 30 minutes. I shall also inform you that it is also, I'm also um, stream, li live streaming the, the thing online. So uh, just that you are informed. Uh, Matthias, the floor is yours. And thank you very much for your talk. All right. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. It's lovely to be here on a hot summer day. Um, I'm very much impressed by your commitment, to be honest, uh, having a beautiful lake in front of the building, really, about you sitting here in the heat of this room. Um, yeah, but I remember well my graduate conferences I, I went to, and I, I, I very much uh, benefited uh, from these conferences, these peer-to-peer -peer really conferences uh, a lot, sometimes even more from, than from conversations with my supervisor. Um, or supervisors. So really, I, I, I can re really understand that you are here, that you uh, present your work here at this conference. Uh, and I was already sitting in a in a uh, in the session this morning. And I think that you you are really presenting a very high quality of, of research. So uh, wish you really um, a very very successful, very good conference that will really inspire progress of your PhD pro progress uh, of your PhD pro uh, projects and uh and really making a, a significant contribution to the field i have been invited uh, to give a talk on um yeah um entitled migration governance in the context of uncertainty i was working for uh, yeah for many years now on migration policy formation migration policy effects and effectiveness and more recently as part of a project uh, a horizon project called uh, quantumic 
quantifying migration policy scenarios, um, we are also reflecting about the role of uncertainties. So when it comes to, obviously to, to the future of migration um, and how state actors and other actors uh, may actually uh, uh, deal with uh, certain levels of uncertainty and different kinds of uncertainties. So that's what uh, um, this talk is about. The sort of uh, the context of complex migration driver environments and in complex migration driver environments, migration processes are volatile and uncertain. So this is a kind of a, a starting statement. Uh, this is um, more or less uh, stating the obvious. Uh, migration processes are volatile. If you look at time series, yeah, there's an up and down, whether it is uh, migration processes uh, into a particular country like Switzerland, or whether it is migration flows into Europe, or whether it's global migration, flows, migration processes are volatile and hard to predict because they are uncertain. But uncertainty is not only an inherent feature of migration, but also of its governance. That's sort of the second argument I, I, I want to make. So there's also the uncertainty involved in the way state and state, states and state actors govern migration um, in, in, in their ways. So let me give an example. Um, going back about 20 years, the UK Home Office was commissioning a, a report or a study um, on the unlikely scenarios and the, and the, and the projected effects of the EU enlargement uh, at a time in 2004 on the UK immigration. Um, the study uh, done by well, well, well distinguished uh, uh, um, migration scholars uh, came up uh, with some numbers of how um, migration flows into UK may involve post uh, EU accession of eight or ten uh, uh, new Eastern European countries. Numbers were about five to, to thirteen thousand additional migrants per year. Um, we know now, in hindsight that this number was a massive underestimation of the actual inflow uh, over the next 10 years. Uh, there was almost a million migrants migrating from Eastern Europe into, into the UK, um, not all permanently, but you know, cross numbers have been, uh, well, that's have been at that scale. And possibly um, this obviously has also triggered a, a governance uh, response, which ultimately may have led to what we now know was the so-called Brexit, right? Because in some way, um, you know, through some some path dependencies, obviously that has really uh, been a massive challenge for for the UK, for the public discourse in the UK, but also uh, the, the governance uh, of migration uh, in in the UK, and obviously um, this sort of you know causal chain in a way was triggered, um, if not sparked by some uncertainties and uncertainties in assessing the true scale of future migration in the UK post 2004. Um, the researchers didn't know that it was only the UK, Ireland, Sweden who opened their labor markets immediately for uh, for new accession uh, uh, for laborers from new accession country, all other European member states have closed their labor markets for a certain transition period. Obviously, uh, uncertainty on governance. Right, it's hard to predict what other other governments may do in certain situations. But that obviously needs to be taken into account when when uh, certain projections are made. So on a larger scale than just one country, obviously we see. Um, the global migration system, um, obviously, characterized by inherent uncertainties. So how may it, may it evolve? We are now at uh, roughly 300 million migrants worldwide, um, sort of migrating through more than 20,000 bilateral migration channels or diets, right? Um, obviously, each country of the 200 countries roughly sort of exposed to very different uh, context with regard to economic, political, social, etc. developments. Um, how may this shape this complex system here of global migration? And how, if ever, can this be governed? So this is what uh, we are looking into. 
uh, when uh, we um, uh, you know think about the the role of uncertainty in migration governance now let me go back you know quite some time so half a century and it's good i mean it's good that we read a lot uh, what's currently uh, coming out in terms of publication, but it's also good to read sometimes some more classical work. So this is a classical work by the uh, Nigerian uh, geographer Akin Mabogunji, um, who has basically applied first time uh, system theory to, to, to the field of migration. And he says, we need to understand migration is no longer, uh, we need to understand migration no longer as a linear, unidirectional push and pull, cause effect movement, but as a circular, interdependent, progressively complex and self-modifying system in which the effect of changes in one part can be traced through the whole of the system. So this is, this is what it may look like, right? There, are, there may be somewhere in this global system of drivers and uh, driving context or driver environments, some sort of disruption can happen every day can have can be anything right and then sort of a, a chain of processes will start uh, and here are so just a, a few errors uh, but too many even to comprehend but each of these errors here are linkages between certain drivers that may trigger migration process may influence the decision making of an individual migrant or an individual migrant household so how can we understand uh, the way such complex driver systems may actually work and do work um, without having perfect information on each of these um, sort of relationships between the drivers. Let me put this into a broader uh, 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 figure, maybe a more abstract uh, figure. So we may um, conceptualize something what we may call a triad of migration related uncertainty. Uncertainty is basically embedded into migration flows. It is inherent in migration drivers, as we have seen, and it is inherent in the governance, in the role of states, in policies. And obviously all this is mutually linked in the short term, but also in the long term, which makes it even more, more complex, right? So um, if we want to understand what states do or can do in order to govern migration um, you know, in the short and in the, in the long term, state actors, policy makers uh, need to know uh, something about the uncertainty embedded into migration flows, embedded into the, the development of migration drivers, and how policy makers, their own sort of um, governance system, but also other relevant um, migration governance unities or entities you know within europe and beyond so this is a, a, a task that is almost impossible to uh, sort of comprehend so uh, i'll come to the point where um, uh, we discuss you know what kind of shortcuts or heuristics policymakers may take in order to really um, come to some sort of decisions uh, with regards to the governance of migration. But let me uh, first make the link to what we often hear these days, the, the times of crisis. It's also part of your title, uh, migration mobility in times of entangled crisis or multiple crisis or poly crisis. Um, also obviously a migration control crisis. And in, in, a, in the system thinking, a crisis is a situation where a system changes. So, so it's, it's, I refer it here not so much to kind of uh, the, 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 the notion used in, in, in discourses, but more a technical definition of a crisis. A crisis is a situation where a system changes or adapts to a new, possibly a new equilibrium, a new steady state, a dynamic equilibrium, as it may be called by economists. Um, and, you know, in this process, in this adaptation process, it may be may appear sort of dysfunctional right um and and this also um then is often also perceived as a as a, as as if policy makers or you know governance uh, units um may not even address or cope with the full complexity of migration so when systems change 
obviously it, it, there's a tendency that governance, migration governance seems to have limited control, to seem to be so, sort of behind uh, the developments and not really in charge or in control. So what is this complexity embedded into migration system? Obviously uh, this migration system uh, involves multiple actors, state, non-state actors, individual decision makers, migrants, non-migrants, etc. Um, it's a it's a process, migration is a process which is constantly influenced by internal and external forces. Yeah, you know the migration theory literature, what these uh, uh, drivers uh, may be, internal and external drivers. And what makes it even more complex, these agents interact. We know the role of networks um, in, 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 in migrant settings, but also broader social networks, but also political networks, obviously, uh, um, you know, embed this, uh, this, 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 uh, um, or are reflect, uh, reflected uh, this, this way of interaction between um, agents. And obviously a complex migration system may be sort of self-organizing, or at least to some extent, yeah, they evolve, so often rather bottom up, but, you know, with some uh, sort of uh, um, sort of, you know, framing by by uh, the regula regulatory system. And um, what we know is that migration systems respond to disequilibria. You know, in very simple terms, um, obviously that's maybe often used, uh, you know, often misused and, and some of used more overly simplistically. Um, you know, if the labor market is, is uh, in, in disequilibrium, if there's an excess supply or an excess demand in terms of workforce, this creates a sort of a push or pull. In very simple terms, this is obviously a kind of a mechanism that is, this is indeed creating incentives to migrate. The, the reality obviously is, is much more complex and just, uh, just push and pull, um, as we know, and as we, uh, as I may argue also here, uh, uh, you know, as in, in terms of a broader uh, systemic uh, approach. And um, this brings me then also to, to the role of uncertainty. M migration is called, uh, is, is affected by what we may call epistemic, knowable, and aleatory uncertainty. So this is now the link to a, some of the recent work we have done as part of the quantum project where we conceptualize epistemic and aleatory uh, uncertainty and uh, which then also obviously these two kinds of, of uncertainties limit the, the way migration can be predicted. So what is epistemic uncertainty? Epistemic uncertainty relates to, uh, to our limited knowledge. The limited knowledge with regard to the way migration drivers influence migration processes, individual migration decision-making processes, or more broader aggregate uh, migration processes. It is about the way migration drivers may evolve and develop uh, in, the, in the short and long term. It is about the way we conceptualize migration, we understand migration, but also the way we measure migration and the limited uh, availability of, of uh, robust and reliable data um, and obviously it's about, you know, limited knowledge and predictability due to non-deterministic decision making of individual migration processes, right? So there's obviously also uncertainty related to individual decision making processes. But still, there, this can be sort of not fully solved, but at least reduced by research, by what we are doing here, what you are doing here, you know, improve our understanding of migration processes, of how migration decisions are made, of how migration governance systems work, the way policies of any kind influence migration processes, etc. This can all be uh, improved and has improved a lot uh, over the recent decade. But what not, what, what's not uh, really possible to reduce is aleatory un uncertainty. These are the so-called black swans, right? It cannot be predicted that there is uh, you know, another major event uh, um, um, that may drive another uh, few million people out of their uh, place of residence. Uh, it might happen, might happen, yeah, obviously um, we can speculate, but it's, there's no way to really fully predict uh, such major events of high impact 
but also of high uncertainty. So unpredictable systemic shocks, or, you know, in, in, in one or the other uh, uh, area, you know, could be uh, kind of a second Fukushima or another Fukushima, could be uh, a natural disaster, um, but could also be a, a major conflict, right? Another invasion um, we wouldn't have expected uh, um, uh, two years ago. Some might have, but you know, I think the, the, uh, uh, the majority probably hasn't really expected it. And obviously, unpredictable behavior. So, epistemic uncertainty in future migration crisis. This is what's going on in the moment, or not in the moment, for many decades already. For instance, at the RLC region, it's a, it's a region which is very much kind of uh, characterized by or was characterized by economic activity related to the RLC, but as you can see, the RLC is, is, has hardly, uh, is hardly there anymore, it has almost disappeared. So what are the epistemic uncertainties uh, 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 related to, for instance, to climate change? So what can we know and what do we know? So we are not completely uh, you know, without knowledge uh, what climate change may do for, to migration, for instance, right? So we know that sea levels will rise. We don't know exactly by how much, yeah, but we know that sea levels will rise. It, they have already been risen by 25 centimeters over the last 100, cent, uh, 100 years, the last century. And they will definitely rise by another 25 centimeters, even in an ideal uh, non-zero uh, emission scenario. And they may even rise even more if uh, emissions continue as they do. Um, Salination. Yeah, we, we know what, where this happens, and uh, what it does to economic activities and livelihoods to uh, individual households, and that will obviously also affect migrant decision-making process. We know what desertification. Uh, uh, that desertification happens. It has already happened. Central Somalia is, is inhabitable. Uh, uh, has become inhabitable. So people have been moving out already, um, and this is going to happen in other. Uh, uh, ecosystems and areas as well. So there will be heat waves. I'm not saying this is yeah, uh, this microclimate, but the you know, general trend is that temperatures rise. Uh, there will be some thwarting and melting of polar ice shields. So this will obviously uh, affect also um, um, uh, households and populations living in, in these areas. So we know relatively well where all this is going to happen. So this is here, you know, a, a map with some circles. We know where hurricanes, the likelihood uh, of hurricanes will increase, where, where people are, are exposed to higher risks of being displaced. Uh, we know where desertification will take place, as it already has started to take place. So this is also, no, this is epistemic uncertainty, but, you know, with the possibility to reduce, we can, through research, I mean, Look at the IPCC reports, uh, all the work that hundreds and thousands of researchers has, have done in order to reduce epistemic uncertainty on climate change. And obviously this is all available to governments as well, to governments as well uh, in order to respond to this. But on top of it, obviously, of a, such a long-term trend like climate change, there's always a possibility that something sudden happens. Yeah? And this is the mentioned aleatory uncertainty. And obviously, if something happens, um, it might not necessarily, necessarily lead to a massive outflux of, of migrants. Um, usually it doesn't, you know, usually people uh, adapt in place or it, the, the shock is not big enough to push people out like a natural disaster, like a flood or a hurricane, right? 98% of all uh, displaced persons due to natural disasters return within a couple of weeks and months. So only very few really migrate for a longer period or, or even permanently. Um, but obviously, nobody can really predict when exactly a natural disaster may happen, but they happen, and uh, but they are not necessarily sort of shifting a kind of a migration system uh, to a new equilibrium. That's not necessarily the case, but it can happen. It can happen. So if a sort of, you know, some, some of the drivers sort of creating a complex driver environment that is actually, you know, putting migrants into a situation where 
staying is not an option anymore. In that case, obviously, we often or usually see large scale out migration, like here in the case of Syria, 20, around 2014 and 15. We, we know all these images, right? So the question is now, what can we do about these uncertainties? As I've already mentioned, uh, do research, let's reduce epistemic uncertainty. Then we can better plan. Then we have more knowledge about the way migration works in complex driver environments. And that's what, what happens. So um, the number of publications on migration drivers here is exponentially increasing. Um, you know, we all contribute to this literature. So we reduce epistemic uncertainty. We know more today than 10 years or 20 or 30 years ago about the way migration works in different contexts. So research helps to some extent. Yeah. And obviously we have also here um, in, in our sort of meta analysis and meta review uh, and systematic review of, of the migration drivers literature. We've looked about on the four, four, 500 papers, empirical papers on migration drivers, and we see that, you know, that kind of a toolbox, a methodological toolbox that we use these days in order to understand and to measure and to sort of, uh, uh, yeah, comprehend uh, uh, the way migration drivers influence uh, migration processes obviously has only expanded over time. So obviously here, this is all contributing to a reduction of epistemic uncertainty. But there's also uncertainty in evidence-based research. Yeah, we, sh we should not think that if we do some research and if there is sort of what we may quickly call some robust result right, on our regressions, um, um, that this is the end of, of the discussion. Um, here an example. You may have been familiar with the, the migration hump uh, theory. Yeah, developed uh, uh, you know some, some by, by Selinsky in the in the in the in the sixties and seventies, but also tested many times later on, and uh, most prominently also recently by by some some researchers, which is exactly showing. Uh, this figure here, you know, um, increase in my immigration rates, uh, um, uh, you know, at lower development levels, uh, but at some point there's a sort of a peak and then uh, migration rates or immigration dependencies rather decline, uh, you know, once a certain development uh, threshold or, or, or level uh, has been passed. And this threshold is often, you know, um, estimated at around seven to 14,000 uh, uh, US dollar. Now, we, we all thought, I mean, I was teaching that uh, you know, over the last 10 years, this migration hump, and so yeah, this is, this is how migration works. And suddenly, you know, there are sort of you know, colleagues who say, ah, wait a second there, we should look more carefully into this. And uh, so, and, and what uh, Benchek and, and Schneider did, they, they looked uh, really uh, into the data and, and so, okay, this is the way um, this migration hump was measured you know, so far by some pooled analysis, cross-sectional analysis, so one cohort after the other. And there we see exactly this kind of hump shape, inverted hump shape of, of migration rates. But what happens if they use panel data? So trace countries, you know, over time and see how the actual uh, uh, immigration rate uh, develops, then they find a negative effect. So nothing like a kind of a Hump uh, uh, an increase, you know, at, at lower development less levels, but um, also for lower development levels, a, a, a negative relationship. So um, again, not completely um, sort of invalidating the migration hump theory, but at, le at least another piece of evidence that helps to question and to consolidate our understanding of the link between development and, and migration. So obviously, um, the question is then: Once we have produced some insights and uh, you know an evidence base, how does this trickle into the political space, the policy making space? How effective is research in really informing policymakers? And to what extent do policymakers really pick up uh, research output, research evidence? 
Right. That's obviously the question that uh, another strand of literature is looking into. So how does this research policy dialogue work? How effective is it? To what extent is produced knowledge actually used? And here, you know, this guy displayed by this slightly overlapping sort of circles. So it's not fully used, but some of it is used, right? And what of it is used? That's the question um, that obviously uh, 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 is, is, is relevant in order to understand to what extent, you know, uncertainty reduction in the field of or in, in, in research or through research is actually then also reducing epistemic uncertainty um, in the area of, of governance and policy making. Obviously, there's a kind of a, you know, sort of a, a, a transmission or communication needed uh, in order you know, to transport the knowledge that is produced and the reduced uncertainty that is produced in research uh, into the policy uh, realms. So, you know, knowing and also assuming that policymakers are sort of uh, not fully informed um, and not fully aware about uh, all sorts of uncertainties, um, policymakers still sort of um, have the sort of the role um, to sort of govern migration, and the question is, how does it, how does migration policy actually shape migration patterns and dynamics? That's a sort of a, a, a strand of research I've done um, over the last couple of years. And relevant here in assessing migration policy effects, obviously, is the question: you know, what's the relevant um, benchmark to say that? You know, a policy, an implemented migration policy, whatever it may be, a, you know, a visa restriction or whatever, or a labor market restriction, access restriction. How effective is it to deter or attract labor migrants or migrants more generally? So this is obviously uh, the question uh, that that migration research has to has to has to solve methodologically. Is it the public discourses? Um, you know. Probably not, because these causes, as we know it, are usually much, much harsher and tougher than actually policies on paper. At least that's what we find in, 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 in when we look at migration policies more specifically and compare it with actual discourses. There's a what we may call a discursive gap, right? Uh, public discourses and political discourses are much more negative, much more you know, restrictive and harsher than actual policies on paper or in law. So probably then it's rather the policies on paper and on law that we should use as a yardstick uh, to assess the effectiveness of policies. And that's what we do. Uh, also because implemented policies are hard to operationalize and hard to measure. So that's why in some research we have actually uh, um, you know, compared migration policies on paper with the actual migration outcomes in order to assess you know, the influence of migration police on the volume the timing, the duration, direction, the composition of migration flows, um, taking into account, obviously, other probably more relevant factors uh, and drivers of migration flows than policies. So that's obviously in, in, then the, the exercise to assess the relative importance of migration policies um, in influencing migration flows in a context of complex migration driver environments. So basically, it's again, you know, assessing sort of the short and long term effects of a policy intervention um, and again related to to epistemic uncertainties, um, our understanding and definitions of of migration, the data that we need in order to assess it. Yeah, is the data available? What quality for what countries, etc. Um, what is our understanding of the role of drivers? Uh, how do we model migration empirically? There are various ways to to uh, um, model migration uh, processes and estimate uh, those. So obviously that all affects the, the, the how here, the, the difference between the actual migration flows and the counterfactual flows, the flows without uh, migration, my, uh, migration intervention. So obviously we have to um, then also um, take into account conceptual reflections about possible effects and side effects or intended and unintended effects of migration policies. So, and here in the sort of a strand of literature, we have 
conceptualized a few of these side effects. So policies, a restrictive migration policy may not only influence migration inflows, but also return flows. So migrants may be pushed into permanent settlement. Uh, they may stay longer than intended. Why? Because they can't re-enter the country or, or may find it more difficult, you know, if policies uh, become more restrictive. So that's why migration duration may increase uh, as a consequence of restrictive immigration policies. It may have an, um, an influence on the intertemporality of migration decisions. Migrants may move earlier than planned or later, so rather procrastinate a migration move depending on you know, anticipated policy uh, changes. Uh, so what uh, what's in the literature also called now or never migration. So if there is a kind of a change, a policy change towards more restrictiveness anticipated, then we see a spike. Usually we see a spike in migration numbers uh, in order to beat the ban, in order to really, um, uh, you know, migrate before the actual uh, restrictions are put into place. Uh, spatial deflection is quite a, a, a I think a commonly known uh, phenomenon. So migrants may shift to other destinations if a particular country becomes more restrictive. Uh, that's often discussed in the context of asylum policies, right? That you know, if one if Hungary becomes more restrictive, so obviously then they are, are you know irregular migrants or asylum seekers are, are are moving elsewhere to other destinations. But also at the global scale, this is uh, sort of a phenomenon that we. Uh, that we may see quite regularly. Categorical substitution, um, obviously migrants can to some extent decide between legal categories. So someone seeking asylum may, you know, as a response to more restrictive asylum policies, go for another entry route, entry channel, like the student channel to apply for a student visa. Or if that's not available, may actually uh, uh, enter the country uh, irregularly. So categorical substitution effects, but also policy environment effects with the way policies interact with you know, other factors, other drivers like the labor markets, etc. Obviously, these are mediating factors that have an effect on policies as such and their effectiveness and the way policies interact. So, I mean, you know, all European countries obviously have a wide set of policy instruments used in different across different areas that are used um, in order to let me call it manage or govern uh, my migration um, obviously these do not work independently from each other but they interact these policies and how they interact obviously is a, is a field of of New, a new strand of research. Usually, we look just at one policy, but you know, a next step is really to understand better the way my policies interact in in in, in often complex ways. Um, I only briefly go uh, over these results that can be measured about policy effects really on a large end basis. Um, yeah, entry policies measured or operationalized, for instance, through visa restrictions, they reduce immigration, but by a quite wide range. So we measured between 26 and 68 percent on average, uh, visa restrictions may reduce the number of immigrants as a consequence of uh, visa in the introduction of a visa uh, restriction, but also reduce return migration or outflows uh, at least, but ag again, also by a quite large range uh, in terms of the average rate. Um, Visa restrictions also reduce asylum inflows, that's what we find, um, but lead to a deflection into irregularity. It's also quite now a kind of, I think it has become more or less common knowledge, right? That this is a quite common feature of restrictive policies and particularly restrictive asylum policies and border policies that migrants don't just stay away, but they look for other entry channels, um, for instance, uh, using the irregular entry channel. But, and this is another strand of research with a uh, migration, restrictive, mi restrictive migration flows do not only you know, influence and affect, you know, some prime target groups like irregular migrants or asylum seekers or whatever, but also we measure it that it reduces the scientific mobility, so uh, mobility of academics. So I don't know how many, probably not that many, uh, had to apply for a visa to come to this conference, but obviously at the global scale, that matters a lot. Um, you know whether um, 
academics and scholars have visa free access to attend a conference or not and need to be need to apply for visa. So that at least involves some costs to apply for visa and, and has an effect. Uh, not as large as we measure it for other groups, so three to six percent. Also on medical personnel, we, we have measured it. So to what extent do visa restrictions uh, reduce uh, you know, doctors and nurses, uh, mobility of doctors and nurses? Also, you know, you know, rather smaller at a smaller uh, scale, um, but still has an effect. And tourist flows. You know, that's what visa obviously also, uh, so at least travel visa uh, um, uh, impact on. So less uh, 20%, but also trade and FDI. So it's not only mobility restrictions do not only affect mobilities or migration, but also all that is related to cross border sort of activities, including trade and capital flows, etc. So this all has to be taken into account when we assess the costs and benefits of mobility restrictions. Um, then the other obviously effect that we um, often see is the deflection into irregularity. Um, that's what I mentioned, but this is here, the, the deflection into other destinations. Uh, so again, we measured it uh, for um, 35 countries on the receiving side and the rest of the world on the on the on the sending origin side, um, about 30 to 60 percent. Again, not a very precise number, but rather a range because it varies uh, depending on you know the the modeling, but also depending on the respective context. Um, but 60 to 30 to 60 percent of the so-called deterred migrants, so those who uh, those the proportion of the flows that are not coming due to a mobility restriction, a visa restriction, are shifted to other destinations. So they are not, you know, completely deterred. They don't stay at home. Um, what policymakers often, you know, wish possibly, right? But they are they are moving uh, to uh, to other destinations. So all this obviously needs to be taken into account when it uh, comes to the management of migration. In another area, uh, we've looked also to what extent do skill selective policies actually attract high skilled migrants. So a different area of migration research, but still obviously policies matter there pretty much. Um, and what we find is it doesn't really affect much the whole set of policies that are implemented, which we tested here, starting from labor market tests, shortages, et cetera, points-based system, all of that, all those instruments taken together have a rather limited effect in explaining absolute numbers of high-skilled immigration. What it is effective on, or more, at least more effective, is the selection. So these, what's, what's called, you know, uh, high-skilled migration policies are relatively effective in you know, increasing the relative proportion of high skilled migrants in the total flow of immigrants, rather than absolutely increasing the number of high skilled migrants. So what this, this means, they rather keep out the non high skilled migrants. So this is what, what, what we find here. So policies have some effect, um, but still relatively uh, limited across the different um, um, migration categories. So, um, Uncertainty, um, obviously, this all has to do with these uncertainties that are sort of um, produced by uh, migration policy interventions um, have to do um, uh, with the multiple objectives that migration policy making involves, right? It, so we may call it a migration policy triad. So at least that's a kind of a contemporary paradigm. So we want to attract high skilled migrants, but we want to select the most productive and the most employable and integratable. But we also want to deter. And I, I say we not really we, but, you know, some policymakers and maybe even the public to some extent. Right. Um, so um, but may also deter so-called unwanted migrants. At least that's part of the, the public discourse. And these these objectives are hardly harmonizable, right? So let, let, let's look into what, how policymaking actually responds. So here we have looked in this uh, uh, project, we have extended the well-established, oh, 
sort of known endemic policy database. Some of you may have used the data uh, in some ways. Here in the Quantpic project, we have extended that policy database, use the same methodology and some of the earlier data, uh, in order to span 31 EU plus countries over the last 30 years. Um, so this, um, we see that they have more, or we could identify more than 5,000 policy changes of these 30 years across 31 countries. So here in this cross tabulation, we, are, we distinguish the scale or the magnitude of policy changes. So major changes, minor, mid-level minor changes, etc. But also the areas of policy intervention, border policy, admission policy, integration policy, return policy. And we see that, you know, there's in all these areas of all scales, there's policy activity. But when we plot it, in these sort of, <laughs> of heat maps, right, uh, where red, reddish uh, coloring uh, uh, reflects more restrictive policy changes over the last, these last 30 years in the area of policy, we see that border policy and return policies have turned on average across all European plus countries that we have included in the analysis uh, have, have uh, turned more restrictive with a few exceptions. Yeah, so there's some variation across European countries, but the average is relatively similar for border policy and return policy. When it comes to integration policies and admission policies, the map turns blue, which means policies have on average turned more liberal. We wouldn't expect that, I think. Um, uh, we, we are, uh, one can be quite surprised that uh, policies have rather liberalized over the last 30 years across Europe when it comes to admission and to integration policies. But again, with, with some exceptions and not uh, sorry, in, the, in a very um, systematic or harmonized uh, way. So there's some sort of divergence, but also convergence in terms of policy trends. So when it comes to border and return policies, those policy areas have turned systematically on average across all European countries, EU plus countries, um, more, more restrictive, whereas admission and reintegration policies more restrictive. But when we look at policy instruments more specifically and other policy, migration policy instruments, we see, so including, you know, uh, visa policies, readmission policies, resettlement policies, but also what we may call a migration related policy like eight aid intervention, which is often you know, tried to use in order to tackle the root causes of migration. That's why we include it here as well as a kind of a policy relevant uh, uh, um, instrument. We see that there's anything but, but harmony or consistency and coherence. And this, what we find here in terms of, you know, different directions of these various policy relevant areas, obviously may to some extent undermine the policy impact of a particular policy instrument. Now, going even a step further, uh, where we don't only look into migration policies as such that, as I would define it, you know, those, these are policies that, uh, where, is where the objective is really to influence the behavior of, of, of migrants or potential migrants. Other policies may still be migration relevant, but their primary objective is not to influence migration as such, but may nevertheless indirectly have an influence on, on migration processes. And this is what we may call the migration environment, well, migration environment policies. This morning, I think there was a session um, on sort of other policies. I think social policy as our paper on the, the role of social policy in governing um, um, migration. This is the, the type of, of, of policy areas I'm, uh, I, I'm thinking of. Trade policy, security policy, humanitarian policy, aid development policy, business policy, investment policies, all, all of that may to some extent, in some ways, and often in some complex ways, have an influence on, on migration processes. So, and, and if we now take it all together, you now we may, sorry, this is one too far, we may be exposed by a quite complex sort of, um, yeah, toolbox uh, that migration policy makers may use in order to shape and govern migration processes. But how to use this toolbox, how to use uh, dozens of policy instruments that have some 
some leeway, some uh, 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 potential in, in shaping migration policies that's still sort of largely affected by epistemic uncertainty and hasn't been resolved yet by research. So that's a field of research, that's a research agenda um, that I think uh, is, is still ahead of us. Now, look, going back to the data I've just presented, this is a plot by European country and what we see over the last 30 years for this 31 uh, uh, European countries is that there's quite some fluctuations, quite the volatility in terms of policy changes. So uh, a change in the, in, the, in the positive area, so above the zero line is a change towards more restrictive policies and uh, below a negative is uh, more, more liberal policies. So it's, there's quite some fluctuation. So this obviously may reflect to some extent uh, a kind of a trial and error on the one hand, but also, um, you know, the, uh, the possibility that migration governance as such is contributing to a some uncertainty because potential migrants ob obviously try to get some information on, you know, existing policy regimes and arrangements and, and, and you know, uh, current regulations. But if, if they change constantly, obviously that creates uncertainties uh, on that side as well. So that's obviously then part of the broader, uh, uh, you know, a, a pool of uncertainties that uh, migration policy may, uh, uh, making may actually contribute to. On the other hand, what we see here, um, on average, we see a, an interesting pattern. The red line here um, reflects and this, uh, this big, uh, depicts the, the average magnitude of policy changes. So across these 5,000 5, policy changes that we have identified, we, we identify that more recent policy changes, in particular since you know, the, the refugee crisis, but maybe even earlier than that, so at least for the last decade, we see an acceleration of policy activity. So there's more, more policy activity going on uh, across Europe. Uh, so um, so though that's actually the blue line, more policy activity, right? It goes continuously up. So while there were on average two policy changes per year per country in the 90s, we found eight policy changes um, in, the, in the last decade on average per, per, per European country. But the, the, the scale of these policy changes, the magnitude is, 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 is decreasing. So what uh, reflected by the red line. So what this shows is that, you know, increasing policy activity on the one hand, but, but of, a diff, of, 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 of a declining scale. So we may call it fine tuning policies. Yeah, more and more policy making is, is sort of going on in terms of policy changes, but not really significant regime changes, not major reforms have, we have seen really over the last, last decades, but more fine-tuning, more adaptations, more, 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 more smaller scale and minor scale uh, policy adaptations. So we may conclude from that. That this is, there's a rationale behind. So in complex and highly uncertain migration environments, the best what policymaking may do is to do nothing wrong. Stick to the status quo, to avoid major, major changes, um, because nobody can know or, or would know uh, what, what the future brings. So, um, and obviously evidence is also limited and Politics is in science, so evidence is obviously not you know, generally embedded and in, in, uh, uh, integrated into policy making and political decisions, but it's used selectively, right? And obviously uh, it's used at, at, at different entry points in the, in the political process. But there's also other principles that matter, not just evidence. We know that, I mean, many of you are political scientists. I, I think you're well aware of the role of of you know ideologies, uh, consensus making, public opinion, etc., partisan politics, special interest groups, all of that obviously matters a lot uh, in the policy making process. 
and evidence and the research policy dialogue of is often used only very selectively in feeding into this sort of uh, complex process of policy making. But what we may actually uh, explore more also from a research and science a scientific perspective is the role of biases in political decision making, because there's a literature uh, in in uh, psychology and cognitive science, etc. that, you know, offers quite a range of heuristics and biases that humans in general use when you know exposed to uncertainty and complex decisions right like a migration decision so that's what uh, one strand of 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 of, of my current work is you know to understand better how do migrants make their decisions when you know only limited information is available what kind of shortcuts what kind of heuristics are used in the decision making process overcoming neoclassical decision making of fully informed agents etc and to just weigh costs and benefits etc we know that this is this is textbook uh, but reality is different so we need to understand how decisions are taken you know individually of individual migrants but also of policy makers and policy makers are still human beings right so they sort of may also apply these biases and heuristics uh in maybe even collectively uh, when they try to come to a to a decision um obviously this is only a research agenda i don't go through this list here and it's only a selective list of possible heuristics and biases that may matter in the decision making process um, um in, in in the governance uh, area but one of it is the status quo bias and uh, that's what we've looked at also in this paper uh, robin was was referring to you know what what, what what's going on on environment induced migration and regulations there and we don't see much of 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 poli po migration policy activity the european green deal mentions migration once yeah so there's not the it's not an issue it's not a topic in in the european governance uh, you know in the area of climate change etc um that migration sort of is you know part of the part of this uh, uh, of the system as well and uh, and there uh, basically we we would or can conclude that there's some sort of status status quo bias uh so a kind of an inactive wait and see tactic um high uncertainties are usually associated uh, with limited policy response so quite a cautious and a, and a, and a rather sort of um hesitant uh way to uh, uh, link also migration um, uh, to to uh, issues of environmental change, and obviously another um, sort of heuristic or bias uh, is obviously what 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 cognitive science or the psychology literature calls the negativity bias. I mean, often this uh, it, it depends a lot of the framing how you know future developments are actually. Uh, uh, influencing uh, contemporary uh, decisions and often uh, the framing and the negative framing in particular obviously has uh, has a larger effect than some positive framing and in that case obviously if migration is sort of out of the story in the context of environmental change and, and climate change then it's often framed from a security uh, perspective and from a security lens this is just an example there's more to explore here with regard to this heuristics and biases and I think um, yeah it's uh, it, it's it's an area that uh, I think uh, creates opportunities for and, and responsibility for, to do more more research here so to, to more or less to conclude because I think I'm approaching already the end of the, my, my time migration governance um, is a cause and a consequence of uncertainty I think that's what uh, my main argument is so in the context of high uncertainty the status quo that's what we've seen, you know, with the increasing fine tuning and fine tuning basically means gov governments stick to the contemporary sort of state of policy, the state of rule um, without, you know, a strong um, impetus for, for major policy changes because, you know, the status quo, status quo is an important reference point um, as it uh, creates the lowest risk of failure possibly. Um, policymakers want to stay in the sort of called safe haven, avoiding major policy reforms, uh, 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 reforms, and obviously, um, you know, the tendency towards fine tuning and symbolic policy activity and policy 
uh, changes. So do I have another couple of minutes? Otherwise I would stop. Yeah, three, three more slides I would have. And um, obviously you are not policy makers, but if you were policy makers, um, and let's, let's assume that, then I, I would come up with some normative uh, uh, conclusions also. So how, how to prepare migration governance for uncertain European migration futures. So how should we then, or how should policymakers, how should European states respond in the context of high uncertainty, epistemic uncertainty, and also aleatory uncertainty? This is a, a, a figure I've taken from my colleague, uh, Jakub Bischak uh, and Emily Barker, who both work on the Quantumic project. This is, if you like, the state of the art um, of current projections of European immigration um, from now um, until 2050. So that's the best what we can know about the future of European immigration over the next 30 years. Right? And when you look at these graphs here by, by European country, you see you know, the, 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 the black line, which is the actual inflows, immigration rates, sorry, these are rates. Um, and then from 2020 onwards, the dotted lines, the upper line is the upper bound of the, uh, the confidence interval and the lower bound, the, 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 the lower bound. And, and the middle line is the, is the, 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 the moving mean. Um, so what do we realize? it's almost useless, <laughs> right? Um, because it could be anything. It could be very high, it could be very low. Um, you know, migration flows of the last two decades, and that was the kind of the calibration period, so 20, from 2000 to 2020, is more or less within the confidence interval. So a projection into 2050, um, with the best knowledge we have, it's the best techniques, with the best data that is currently available, gives us this plot, right? So what do policymakers, what should they do with this? Right? How should they respond here uh, with regards to uh, sort of, you know, these projections and the, the possible developments um, uh, in the area of my migration? So the first thing I think is, we need to know and to monitor the factors that cause systemic risk and epistemic uncertainty. I mean, there are uh, certain scientific unknowns, and obviously this can be reduced. Data can be improved, models can be improved, and there, a lot has happened uh, over the last one or two decades, uh, also with some, 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 you know, also um, projection techniques, etc. Uh, I'm not an expert on that. That's why I'm, I cannot uh, exactly say, but Jakub Bischak, who was on our project, he is really an expert on, on forecasting. And uh, a lot, if you read his recent book, uh, a lot has uh, uh, developed uh, also made logically in terms of, of, of forecasting. But obviously, there are still limitations, as you see. We need to understand, and policymakers need to understand and know about the vicious cycle, feedback effects, right? Uh, it's, it's important to know that if, if border enforcement becomes more restrictive, um, migrants don't just stay away, they move to, into other legal channels or irregular channels. Um, so there's a, a feedback effect also on the actual uh, uh, policymakers on how to, how to respond then on, on these sort of migratory responses. Um, obviously, uh, policymakers have to be aware that, uh, you know, vulnerabilities and also incentives uh, are very much, also migration incentives are very much group and context specific. So there's, there's not a kind of a one, one size fits all policy. So that a policy that, that uh, works well in the, in the context of, of Syrian migrants does not equally work uh, for, for Ukraine refugees. But the context is different. The groups are different. Male versus female families, etc. I mean, you know it, right? So obviously, um, this is this is important to 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 know and to to monitor uh, when it comes to 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 governance, conflict in interest and values. Obviously, how you know the policy process as such is obviously not 
free of uh, of uh, of uh, partisan interests and and, and 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 other uh, factors the role of social dynamics techno technological advances you name it i i i don't want to uh, uh, go through this list uh, in full so it is important that we reduce uh, policymakers try to induce and also fund the reduction of of um, uh, epistemic uncertainty as much as possible um, and obviously knowing the reasons for the limited effectiveness of policies uh, we've looked into unclear reference points um, we have uh, learned and there's evidence on the migration policy side effects or the unintended consequences this needs to be taken into account um, uh, when it comes to you know improving policy effectiveness we know about limited policy coordination there's you know, systematic and massive policy incoherence across different uh, fields um, there are migration policy field feedback effects and obviously inappropriate policy design in particular you know when it comes to the broader policy toolbox um, and you know with conflicting policy objectives that not really harmless but also certain biases in the decision making process on the ignorance of some evidence so and still if all this taken into account um policymakers need to be prepared or prepared to be unprepared i think that's um, the, the main conclusion the residual so not all epistemic uncertainty can be resolved and the allotry uncertainty uh, 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 neither so some con uh, contingency plans some preparation plans obviously when certain major events happen obviously is crucial in order to respond adequately to increasing migration flows in this context i thank you very much for your attention Thank you very much, Matthias, uh, for the fascinating lecture. Now I will take a few questions or comments in, uh, in the audience. So uh, we pass the mic and yeah. Thank you, Professor Jacob, for, for the insightful presentation. Joseph Gall from the Center for the Study of Global Human Movements at the University of Cambridge. You've talked about the Linsky's model and its in inconsumabilities, and you also um, you also um, define the um, crisis as where the system changed. So I'm wondering if there has been any talking about the Europeans like um, refugee or migration crisis. Are there any evidence or positive implications that has already happened after the crisis? Thank you very much. Maybe you answer directly, or um, yeah, maybe you will have like a lot of questions. Maybe, so maybe we, we collect. Maybe we to think about it, but um, yeah, maybe, maybe we, we collect. We, we collect mm -hmm. uh, three questions, three comments, and then. Thank you, Professor, for your really insightful presentation. Of course, I'm anticipating your responses while you were going, but um, I'm going to ask anyway. Uh, two short points. One was about um, the relationship between policy making and the actual effect it's having on the. I'm forgetting the exact term you used. I'm wondering one way to explain that would be, of course, uh, fine tuning. But I was wondering if there's another performative aspect to making policy where policy is being made for policy's sake to show uh, increasingly anti migration de democracy that you know, they were doing something when actually not much is being done. And the second point was about. Um, so, yeah. yeah. I think the assumption here was that uncertainty would be undesirable, and I'm wondering about the agnophilia of policymakers, because the less you know, the easier it can be to blame uh, on things on crisis and policy failures on crisis, coming to the theme of the conference. I'm wondering, as researchers, if our job is to um, well, be acknowledged, but if the impulse is to fundamentally ignore that knowledge precisely to have this idea of, you know, I don't know. Like, oh, you don't know what's going to happen, and then you'll be able to um, explain policy failures in the future. So, how, how do we how do we deal with that as researchers? Yeah. Mm, thank you. Um, yes, thank you very much for your rich and inspiring presentation. Um, yeah, well, listening to the first part of the presentation, I have this impression that migration policy is the result of a weighted reflection of scientific papers. And there is this group of experts uh, evaluating scientific papers 
Um, however, I am the author of the paper that you mentioned, social policies to control migration. And I have been doing research on welfare migration, which is this uh, strange phenomenon that it has been repeatedly refuted by science that migrants could not emigrate to get social benefits. And there are there is a lot of science uh, arguing that, but still we see that there is this wave of uh, restrictive reforms. So of course I am a skeptic and to what extent is knowledge migration policy possible? Uh, when we see that it's uh, made in increased uh, politicized uh, context. And the second uh, quick comment is about bias. Uh, I think we also need to refer to the scientific bias, uh, not only policy making bias, but we as scientists are also biased. So we could agree on uh, we want to have better policies, uh, but do we agree on which? These policies are, or we also have our own values and ideologies, etc. So it's a difficult debate. It's knowledge policy neutral in that sense. Thank you. Uh, so just to start, maybe answering these okay, three yeah. questions. Um, and you can sit here and maybe take this microphone. Can you just give? Okay. And give you another one. For, okay. So first round of questions, and then we'll go for it. Yeah, thank you very much for really um, insightful questions. Maybe let me start you know, with the last one. Scientists, we are biased. We are human beings. Um, we are biased in the way we um, we become scientists, right? Uh, um, starting really from there. Uh, who actually becomes a scientist. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, once a scientist, you know, what area do we infer? And once decided for a particular area, you know, what questions do we ask? Um, what kind of research are we doing? What kind of research are we capable to do? And also what kind of research are we able or, or willing to do? Um, but, but this all obviously are inputs into scientific progress that is made collectively. Um, but the, this this sequence of 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 of, of, um, of selection steps, right? Who is ending up in research? Who is ending up in science? What, what, what bunch of people is this actually that is doing science and that is doing migration research? What is their, what are their priors? What are our priors? What are our ideologies? Right? Obviously, we are, we are far from objective uh, in general when it comes to migration. Um, I think it, it's not, not, uh, I think it's quite likely that the majority um, sitting in this room is 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 left leaning, is pro migration, is uh, has a, is a very is skeptical about the role of states in shaping migration, um, and still we are trying. Most of us, I think, trying to apply some you know scientific standards, good scientific standards and practices, being as objective as possible. Um, with and this comes with limitations. So yes, um, we are biased. Uh, we are biased also uh, in the way we interpret evidence, and uh, we are biased in the way we select evidence in our communication with policymakers. I mean, let's be frank. Um, if there is evidence that restrictive policies work to some extent in particular contexts. And in particular situations, we are not the first ones who would uh, uh, really sort of uh, announce this very publicly. Uh, and I think that's that's why there's some suspicion on the policy making side towards um, migration scholarship, because there's a perception that this is that we are biased, that we are selective in the way we produce evidence and we communicate evidence. And I think there we have 
we as a community, as a migration research community, have to uh, be very clear in order to avoid irrelevance um, that we pursue in our research with the highest academic standards, uh, put aside as much as possible our individual priors, our individual ideologies, our individual uh, ways of thinking about migration when we when we collect our data, when we design our projects, and we also interpret our, our, our research. So that's at least kind of an ethical code almost, right? Uh, um, that uh, doctors have, uh, but also we should have as migration researchers. We should not be kind of too political. Um, and at least not uh, being abused by our own uh, our own priors and, and political uh, opinions. Um, yeah, how does evidence trickle into policy making? That was your second question. Um, very selectively and only over time, sometimes over years and decades. Um, I think something like a migration pump, that's obviously far from you, but it, 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 it only over recent years, and maybe the last decade or so, it has really arrived in, 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 in political and policy making documents, right? And sort of, you know, this is this is it's a it's a lengthy process, but it's a tedious process sometimes. And uh, and and we should expect that well, if suddenly we come up with an interesting or surprising or counterintuitive result that this may quickly be picked up uh, by policymakers. I mean, in most Horizon 2020 or Europe projects now, um, it is, impact is an important factor and then all projects do a lot on, uh, you know, sort of communicating research to policymakers. But the more, the more you know, uh, research become active in that area, obviously there's there's also some sort of information overload on the receiving side. So obviously it, it, it's, a, it's a matter of becoming clearer, more targeted, becoming more effective also in the communication, but there's also more competition um, in, in, in sort of influencing policy makers. And obviously on the other side, you know, then uh, policy makers obviously become more, more selective. And, uh, and when we look into, into um, Research that is done. Uh, no, I have one survey. I, I also have a slide on this uh, because uh, there was a, a survey done uh, among policymakers uh, where policymakers asked, us what, what are the main sources of your information? How you know what shapes your ideas about a particular uh, uh, policy issue? Um, at the top of this of this list is usually informal meetings, informal conversations with some some selected you know um informants could be researchers could be other experts right to uh have a, have a stronger uh role in influencing at least particular uh, policy makers so it's not uh we should expect um that our nice policy briefs that uh, we write very actively in all our horizon projects um um have, have, uh, you know per se, a, a very strong impact. Maybe sometimes quantity needs <laughs> quality, but uh, usually it's the, the, the high quality research is very targeted to uh, and through uh, a specific communication channel to some key stakeholders and key policy makers. Um, yeah, there was the other question about uh, how can we interpret this sort of um the, 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 the diminishing magnitude of policy changes uh, fine-tuning indeed yeah but symbolic policies and must say appearance of control right? uh, that's certainly a, 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 a motivation behind uh, doing something rather than nothing i mean that would be extreme case of say school policy right um so doing something something that is not too harmful um to political constituents, but also to harmful in terms of uh, some regime effects, so that policies, uh, policy uh, may not be reversed. So what we see is a lot of policy reversals going on, 
you know, some minor annotation, age of entry, you know, year up and year down, etc. This is this is also what we trace in this database, but it's almost irrelevant, right? Uh, but this is at least uh, enough to say we do something um, on Hungarian or in Hungarian. Yeah, that was an interesting question about uncertainty being negatively framed. Um, could there be something positive about uncertainty? It's an interesting question. Um, I think we all feel some unease when it comes to, to uncertainty, um, but sometimes it can indeed be instrumental. So, um, intended ignorance of that, right? Um, I have to think more about it, really, uh, how this may then shape the policy making process. Um, I think, you know, using and utilizing information and evidence selectively is, is part of that, right? So the selective use of evidence and uncertainty reduction is certainly part of, could be part of such a, a, a motivation. Um, but I, I think first I have to have more thinking about it, but also I would like to see more and more evidence that this is indeed uh, also uh, sometimes framed positively from the policy, policy, policy making side. I, I haven't seen that, uh, but it would be an interesting um, question to, to explore. Yeah. But I think we will take a few more questions here, yes. Thank you so much for your answers. Like it's very, uh, we are really only took a minute each, especially when it comes to uh, being front on the introduction and how it comes from the global results. As we maybe I realized that we most of the problems happening in uh, migration, the migration basically they are coming from in, in the global south. But much of what we see funds studies to search researchers coming from global uh, north. So I think one way to reduce the um, the bias and to have more well informed evidence based such as recommendation to policymakers is to have some collaborations with the people from the global south because they are affected by that and informed about what's happening and maybe this can draw like uh, needs or a big cancer um, satisfy their needs in the sense that we understand what they say by the people who are really affected by that so i i need i want to know what's your opinion on that as well Thank you very much for your panel. I'm very happy to be here. I followed your work very well. Um, you said something about the academic bias and the problem that I myself am having in publishing and trying to convince my professor of sometimes the, like he mentioned, the global south already have a conception of what something should be. So, for example, defining who's a migrant, who's an IDP. Um, sometimes as academics, we're not allowed to um, report the facts as we find them because we're supposed to put them into a mode of a predefined, um, predefined concept. So um, my question is, how do we suppose that we can overcome that? How do we report our work in a way that is still ethical, accepted by our institution, our professors, and even sometimes journalists? Hello, thank you so much for this presentation. I have a question and then a question slash comment. So I guess my first question is coming from or thinking from the perspective of critical migration studies or this more recent literature, the reflexive migration studies, which views migration, especially from the south going northwards, very much as a movement of decolonization. I'm wondering, um, coming from this perspective of looking at migration governance, 
a governing uncertainty, a governing crisis, what, uh, where you situate uh, the agency and people who are moving, and what weight that's given as well in these frameworks that are um, seeking to to analyze or perform or to understand or reconceptualize migration governance. And then secondly, my question slash comment is related to um, something you had just said in, in answering this question about bias related to politics. And I was hoping you could uh, maybe expand. I think it's great that you were very transparent about this and I wish we could have a discussion, but the role of researchers and politics, the politics of knowledge production. And I think um, I, I wonder and I, and I have concerns about uh, of course, this this relationship between researchers and, and, and the politics of knowledge and, and knowledge production. And so I guess I'm wondering, what is political neutrality? What does that look like? And what responsibility do you see us having as researchers in close relationship with our interlocutors, with our power dynamics and power asymmetries when we've been trusted with, with knowledge of lived experiences? And how can we inform policy that makes our world more inhabitable and makes it more just for people on the move without taking a political stand. Thank you very much. If you have one more question or... Yeah, go ahead. I don't know if he will have time to answer all your questions. Yeah, actually, yeah, but, uh, uh, go ahead. Earlier. So, uh, thank you, Matthias. Uh, great to see you here. Um, it's, uh, it also ties into the question of knowledge production, and obviously, we've heard uh, there is no immediate translation of knowledge into policy. But still, um, my question also concerns um, the matter of What's your stance on new uh, methods, new technologies of data collection, computational social science, the use of, uh, for example, social media data to anticipate um, migration flows? So, um, how do you see that as a person coming from quantitative methods, from applying statistics, etc.? Um, what are the chances? What are the the problems uh, with these uh, new methods? Thanks. Yeah. And Lorenz. Can we see Matthias? Are there too many questions or can we keep adding uh, more? I'm going to be selective on the answer. Yeah, <laughs> you, you can check. Uh, you can skip mine because it's going to be a bit of a provocative question. But I should say I'm a big fan of your work. Um, I visited the Foundation Policy Center. We use your work a lot in there. Uh, but the provocative question is, I have the impression looking at um, what you've done and what you may try to convey to policymakers also. Um, so there is a strong attention to numbers. Uh, so, for example, moving people from one category to the other and decreasing, again, maybe the volume or maybe working on the composition, as you mentioned, and relatively little attention paid to the condition. So not only the agents, but also the conditions of those uh, who move. And this is important when we think about effectiveness. So you were talking a lot about effectiveness of different policies. Um, I'm, I'm Italian, as of course you, you can understand from my accent. Italy uh, made a very big deal with uh, Libya a few years ago. Actually, the center-left uh, um, politician who was at the time Minister of the Interior was that, um, a successful and effective policy. If you look at the numbers, yes, amazing success, a uh, huge decrease in the number of people traveling to Italy, which is what the government wanted to achieve. Was, that, was it actually effective, my perspective as a citizen, also as a researcher? No, it was not, because it has huge, uh, made huge harm on people who were pushed into detention centers in other conditions. So, um, the provocative question is, don't you think there is maybe a little bit too much attention on numbers, which pushes away the focus on other conditions for those who are affected indirectly by those policies? Again, you have to skip this and maybe talk to Aurelia. Thanks. Yeah, 
I would think just uh, the last question. I will start with this one. <laughs> I, like I, I actually, first, I thank you. Your work has always been very inspiring, and especially efforts to try to create some kind of systematic analysis. So I have a, I have a couple of questions, so I'll try to stick to really just one, one, two. First, I have, I have a, quite a problem with the concept of the system. You started off talking about migration system, and I, don't know if you have some ideas behind it, but in my, in my head, a system has some kind of set values, norms, um, not quite like a political science regime, but it has a certain type of, of uh, outcome uh, prediction. So I don't quite understand your concept of why you uh, look at the complexity of migration as a system. And this leads to my second question. Migration policy are obviously very critical, but what about other types of policies that, in effect, serve um, to affect migration? One point I consider is the knowledge that we do not have, for example, on climate change and environmental um, catastrophes on migration flows. We know, for example, that, in fact, crises of, of environment can equally serve people to stay rather than move. Right? So there, are, we, we actually don't know very very well whether people are, who gets to move when there is a crisis and who actually get, uh, stays or becomes immobile. And so as a political scientist, I have to go back to my very original mentor who, I, I, who said that essentially 96% of the world does not move. And yet, and so we're looking at or five percent of population. What about really instead of just looking at migration, we're looking at uh, the other side. Why are uh, certain people in the same condition actually not moving, as opposed to those who are moving um, sort of to the destinations and systematically? So this is something I I wondered if you have thought about immobility as the counterpart. I'm sorry for the others, but uh, we, we are really late. Uh, so Much time? Uh, we have like six minutes. Okay. You okay. have six minutes. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, no, no. So I'm right now. I'm working on a paper as part of the Meet Next project. Um, Horizon um, project on migration model and access, which has a tentative title. If I make some maybe slow this. Why on earth uh, are so many people able about? So that's a working title, but but that's exactly what I wonder as well. Right? I mean, this 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 sort of selection on the on the on the dependent variable, um, and uh, still a relatively little knowledge. Just that now, you know, a, a rapidly expanding literature on mobility, um, for example, that, um, but also in the context of environmentally induced migration. I mean, there's. Um, was been involved in the conference, I think it was in 2019 on environmental non migration. So there's environmental research, uh, less uh, social scientific research, but I think also some changes there. It's aware of the fact that many people are trapped uh, and not, be, not being able uh, uh, to move for a safe, um, sort of um, declining life things and, and, and sort of. Uh, Unstable environments. So more to, more to be done. No question about that. Um, but I think it's it's it's, it's picking up. So I, I think there's there's certainly a, a tendency towards that. Um, the other question was uh, why system. Yeah, you were referring that uh, it, it refers to a set of values and norms, and I would do the same. Yeah, even set of norms and values are part of of the of Interlock systems, basically. So, my so what we may call a migration culture. So, it was a set of norms, in particular context that you know, uh, the passage that migration is something to do, etc. So, this is this is part of a system, the cultural uh, system in place that is often sort of a very strong force, obviously, in, in driving migration. Often, if, if stronger than the economic system, right? Like these systems are sort of uh, interlinked. So if there's not just one system, there are many systems that are interlinked. 
and 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 that's why I think it is a useful uh, sort of lens to look at, at, at migration. I I I, I like your question. Uh, I've, I've sort of forgot the name, but uh, Lorenzo. Um, I think you're partly right. Yeah, uh, obviously there is there's a tendency in my research at least uh, on numbers. Yeah, uh, so I'm, I'm quite happy if something can be measured. Um, but also the phenomena that you describe, you know, the nasty side of policies, right? Cannot be easily measured, but they should be measured, and we should advance on making them measurable as much as possible because numbers are effective. And I think. Um, you know, the more we can actually measure, and I, I've tried this in this in a paper which I call deflection into irregularity, to make this visible right, that you know uh, the the effect of a visa restriction is not just that asylum uh, application numbers go down, um, but that there's an increase in irregular entry and, and border apprehensions and apprehensions on territory, etc., with all the known consequences. Right, um, of possibly being deported, etc., um, or at least detained. Um, this obviously, this is this is a reality, and um, I, I, I'd like to study this more and, and measure it more, and creating also conceptual links uh, between you know, uh, policy interventions and its its um, side effects. Um, because I think the more we provide also quantitative evidence on on these matters, um, yeah, the more we can show, you know, or provide a broader picture on, um, you know, on policy um, effects, not necessarily effectiveness, because that refers to an objective, right? But at least the effects of, of policies, and this can be, um, you know, Almost in a uh, framed in a in a, in a in a in a almost neutral way. Obviously, then once we see what policies do to numbers of detentions, etc., and border crossing, and even death at sea, right? All of that. I mean, this is this is highly effective if we can make this this measurable. Um, because stories are really good and important individual stories. We know that, um, but I think. Supporting these individual stories with a broader evidence base of what policies may do, also in terms of uh, nasty outcomes, I think it uh, can, can can only be uh, you know support the case and, and strengthen the case. Um, yeah, where does the agency? The agency usually sits with the migrants, right? The agency sits with the migrant. The migrant is even a what we may call a forced migrant, right? Some, someone who leaves involuntarily, uh, or sometimes is even moved, is located. Uh, of there, you know, it's a continuous scale in terms of agency. But I think also Oliver Bakewell and others would argue there's a certain minimum level of agency in any types of migration. And I think that's um, depends on the context, depends on the resources, um, depends on the level of information. Um, but you know, as a starting point, I would say the agency is with the migrants uh, or some minimum level of agency. Um, and sort of, you know, the more resources are accessible and available. Just the stronger is you know the possibility to, to realize uh, aspirations that migrants may have or, or people may have uh, could be migration could also be staying right it's not necessarily migration not always for first choice um, obviously that's then you know it depends on the capabilities where aspirations can be can be realized. Um, one minute. One minute. One last answer. Oh, yeah, there's, yeah, the, 
notion of political neutrality and can can we be neutral in order to make change or contribute to change? Um, we can be both, I think. We can be political activists and we can be researchers. Um, and, and I mean real researchers. So those who do research to the highest standards, um, highest ethics of objectivity and, you know, and they can grab this because there is also this blur sort of research. And I think that's, that's often the problem right? where, where political genders and research sort of is mixed up and it's not very clear what's behind a research project was behind a, a statement that seems to be coming out of a research um, because the evidence is all not really fully provided. Always is at best anecdotal evidence. And I think um, the broader the evidence base, the more rigorous and reliable the evidence base is, the stronger can also political claims be in terms not just you know to make the issue known but also to make it changed and at least to make it aware in public discourses and, and, and in policy science because i think that's the first step um, for, for, for any change so I, I i don't think that we as migration scholars need to be political activists per se um, in order to, you know, sort of change, bring change to uh, um, the dark sides of migration, um, because migration can also be something very positive. I think we all appreciate it uh, as academics and scholars and highly mobile people. Right? So obviously that's uh, uh, that's one area, one type of, of, of migration mobility that is. And so it's obviously uh, it's a very dark side. And in order to, to, to change that, bring light into this area and bring change, um, because maybe this research is needed and communicating in an effective way. And if individually someone thinks some activism is, is needed outside, outside research, then so may be. Um, but that's then a little decision. I think uh, it can also be quite effective if we you know, see to, to to our academic research and bring change, hopefully bring change that way. Not immediately, as we discussed, but over time, uh, in Germany, we have the saying that Peter Tropenhoek and Schein, so constant uh, sort of, I don't have a translation for that, but the constant sort of is one so impact as an impact on curve. That's I think what what makes it also motivating for for me and hopefully for, for all of you uh, to stay in academia, to stay in research, um, to find your way uh, um, you know, through academic challenges and academic competition uh, in order to bring change. Um, I think there's there is some intrinsic value in research, but it has also instrumental value. And this is uh, what we all, uh, I think, should aim for and probably do aim for that we uh, use research also instrumentally to, you know, make. Now it becomes, it patterns almost a means, well, a better place, although I did sort of for, uh, for migrants to make it a better place. This was a perfect moment to close the session. That was uh, intended to be so, yeah. yeah. So we will have dinner downstairs, on the ground floor and in the garden, and then be back for the parallel panel sessions at 2.30. Thanks again, Matthias, and thanks. Thank you.